In this video, we will talk about some of the conservation actions that our program undertakes to protect rare plants, some of which are currently hot topics in the conservation world and are still being discussed and researched. Let's first go over some of the biggest threats to rare plant conservation in New England that our program works to address. Many of the threats to rare plants are also threats to common plants. However, rare species are often more sensitive because they tend to have fewer and smaller populations and lower reproductive fitness and recruitment. The first major threat is habitat destruction and conversion. This is a very big threat, especially with our world population growing and more and more urban and suburban areas expanding. We are now facing a dramatic loss of habitat for rare plant species. Oftentimes, we go looking for a historical occurrence of a rare plant population from the early 1900s, only to find that the area where the plants once existed is now completely paved over. Just as it was found in the state of the plants, invasive species and pests are directly impacting our rare and native species. Two examples shown here are Asian bittersweet, Salacious orbiculatus, a species that was brought in from Asia which can grow and girdle trees, preventing sap flow and killing them, or pulling trees down and outcompeting our native species until all that is left is Asian bittersweet. The other photo on the right shows an insect pest that affects our hemlock trees, Suga canadensis, called the woolly adelgid, Adelgis sugae. This is a problem even at Garden in the Woods, where the woolly adelgid is killing the hemlock trees. Insect pests like the woolly adelgid can affect rare plants either directly or indirectly, such as through habitat destruction. Another threat to rare plants involves changes to natural systems, such as altered hydrology and fire regimes. These are two aspects of the landscape which happen naturally and are directly and indirectly affected by humans in ways that impact the survival of rare species. For example, beavers are an important engineer of the New England landscape, which many plant species have adapted to. They can cause natural changes in hydrology by creating wetlands that our native flora thrives on. Human activity of rerouting or filling in wetlands along with damming up rivers can have an effect on the flora that is very different from beaver-related flooding. Fire in certain parts of New England is natural and helps to, to maintain habitats of coastal and sand plains and rocky south-facing ridges. However, when fire is suppressed, the habitat changes and certain species may not do well in, with increased competition. Also, when a fire does come through, it burns at a much higher temperature due to increased abundance of fuel, which can damage plants that are adapted to regular, low-intensity fires. Lastly, climate change is the big threat in the back of all of our minds. The effects are so great, especially because certain species have adapted to the specific climate of the habitat where they currently reside. As climate change progresses, it is unclear if these species can survive a change in temperature and moisture and adapt to a new climate, or if they can migrate to better suited habitats. If not, these species will eventually become extirpated from their current range. There are a lot of unanswered questions and uncertainty in the future with climate change, especially for the survival of rare plant species on the landscape. These seven actions are different topics important to rare plant conservation that we act on and consider to help combat some of the threats faced by rare plant species in New England. We will go over each one individually. First, we want to protect as much intact, diverse, complex habitat as possible. We want to increase connectivity between natural areas to facilitate corridors for species migration, pollination, and seed dispersal increasing genetic connectivity and diversity. This is especially important with the threat of climate change. We also want to remove harmful invasive species so they can no longer outcompete native species and decimate native ecosystems. Along with increasing connectivity, we want to build resiliency by maintaining large blocks of complex habitat. This helps species and ecosystems be more resilient to the effects of climate change and helps to prevent invasive species from becoming established. It is more difficult for invasive species to take over in a large ecosystem composed of diverse native species than a fragmented ecosystem with low species diversity. Larger blocks of complex habitat allow native plants to more easily move around and interact with other aspects of the ecosystem. Second, we monitor plant populations for health and threats. 
Surveying rare plant populations to help with the large volume of monitoring needs across New England is why our volunteers are so essential to our program. We could not do it without the help of so many passionate volunteers. Here are the species counts of rare plant species in New England from Flora Conservanda, both the original 1996 version and the 2012 updated version. In this table, focus on the Division 1, globally rare, and Division 2, regionally rare, numbers. Notice that there are fewer Division 1 and 2 species in 1996 than there are in 2012. Thanks to monitoring efforts by our volunteer surveyors over these 16 years, we found five more globally rare species and 54 more regionally rare species in New England. Monitoring is so crucial for our understanding of what is happening to rare plant species, and with a new update of Flora Conservanda coming in the next few years, we are adding thousands of populations which may impact the listing and prioritization for monitoring. A few more numbers to help understand the amount of monitoring we undertake. There are currently roughly 1,800 populations of the 62 globally rare taxa found here in New England. There are also approximately 3,000 populations of 326 regionally rare taxa found in the region. Over the course of the nearly 30 years since our program first started, there have been over 11,500 surveys of rare plant occurrences conducted by NEPCOP task force members and PCVs. We also have thousands of seeds collected and banked from over 2,000 populations across over 400 species. Third, we conduct research and experimental analysis. As rare plant surveyors, you are the boots on the ground gathering critical data to identify population trends and possible drivers. The data you collect will be critical to identifying and testing hypotheses that will enable the future conservation of that species. Some species and EOs have research questions associated with them. In these cases, please take a few minutes to observe the factors identified and add some comments to your field form that may help in answering these specific research questions. Fourth, we collect and bank seed to preserve the genetic variation of the plants of New England. Before delving into the whys of seed banking, let's go over what seed banking is. While land and habitat conservation, called in situ conservation, is the dominant method of conservation in general, seed banks provide benefits that no other conservation approach can. In situ conservation protects against development, but taken alone, it cannot protect against various impacts that rare plants may be subject to. Ex situ conservation, including seed banking, is a method to help protect rare plants from natural habitat shifts such as succession, natural or anthropogenic catastrophes, invasive species, and climate change. For example, lance-leaved arnica, Arnica lanceolata, is a globally rare species with a few populations in Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. It is found in alpine ravines and sometimes on middle elevation stream banks. We bank seen from Lance Leaves Arnica populations to help protect it from threats that in situ conservation cannot. A population of seeds in a seed bank, if properly collected and curated, represents the genetic diversity of the source population more completely than a collection of live plants in a botanic garden. Unlike live plants or animals, Seeds are safe from inadvertent artificial selection, which can occur when plants are grown outside their original habitat. Furthermore, seeds in a seed bank may remain viable for hundreds of years, can be readily tested to monitor viability, and can be germinated and grown at short notice should the original population experience a dangerous decline or a catastrophic collapse. Seed banks have historically focused on banking seed from different crop species. The Svalbard Global Seed Vault, pictured at the top on the island of Spitsbergen, Norway, is run by the Global Crop Diversity Trust and Nordic Genetic Resources Center, and now exclusively holds crop seed collection duplicates from regional crop seed banks from all over the world. In recent years, new seed banks have arisen with an explicit focus on banking seed from wild species. In 2000, the Kew Royal Botanic Garden started the Millennium Seed Bank in southern England, which holds exclusively wild plant seeds from around the world. Recently, the Millennium Seed Bank met its first goal of banking 10% of the world's seed plants, 
with over 1 billion seeds collected and stored. Native Plant Trust has contributed scores of species to the seed bank, but only seeds from common species, as U.S. export laws forbid international shipment of federally listed plant materials. Closer to home, Native Plant Trust helped found a network of seed banking organizations focused on protecting seed from imperiled plants called the Center for Plant Conservation. Our own seed bank at Garden in the Woods currently holds seed from 25 federally listed species and over 200 regionally protected species as well. Our goal for seed banking rare species is the same as the International Convention on Biological Diversity Global Strategy for Plant Conservation, Target 8. At least 75% of threatened plants should be in ex situ collections, growing collections, and seed banks, preferably in the country of origin, and at least 20% available for restoration and recovery programs. Seed banking and rare plant seed collections are a very large part of our program, and it's important for volunteers to help as much as they can. Our current goal is to collect seed from species with 1 to 5 and 6 to 20 occurrences in New England, and to collect from the most central, northern, eastern, southern, and western populations of a rare plant species on the New England landscape. We use distance as a proxy for genetic diversity to ensure that we are collecting from genetically distinct populations. We have developed these widely used guidelines and use this method both to rank priorities for seed banking and identify species that are not amenable to standard seed banking conditions. Volunteers can check the proposed action section in survey signups to determine if a survey is targeted for seed collection or not. Fifth, we manage habitats for rare and common plants where necessary and feasible. We need to think hard and make some decisions before we head out to manage a rare plant population. We first need to determine how to prioritize which rare plant sites should be managed. Often, we have to look at two factors to decide if we should manage a rare plant population. First, will the habitat present at the site be resilient under climate change? And second, is management at the site feasible in terms of time and money and have a good chance of success? The reality is we need to make some hard decisions in regards to which populations are the highest priority and pick the most logical rare plant populations to manage. We hope to provide opportunities for our volunteers to get involved in ongoing management projects. We also augment, reintroduce, and introduce plant populations within their historic range as needed. This is not always easy to do, especially in the historic range where the species once occurred and now no longer does. While some reintroductions are harder than others, one successful example is that of sand plain gerardia, Agalinus acuta. This species grows in sand plain habitats on the Cape and southern coast of New England and can also be found growing in graveyards. There is something about the way graveyards are managed that allows this plant to flourish. We successfully introduced this species to the Crane Wildlife Management Area, a habitat within its historical range, where it still exists as an occurrence we monitor today. So it is possible to reintroduce species to their historic range, just challenging. Another successful augmentation project is that of Robin cinquefoil, Potentilla robinziana. This species grows on top of Mount Washington in New Hampshire. We found that one population was heading towards extirpation on one part of the mountain. We augmented the declining population with plants we grew up from seed collected from a nearby thriving population and brought the counts back up to a stable level. Lastly, we plan assisted migration if necessary. This is a hot topic in the conservation world and we are still discussing whether this will be a strategy the conservation department will employ in the future. Some conservationists are very much against the idea, and some are very much for it. What is assisted migration? Assisted migration, also known as assisted colonization or managed relocation, is the intentional act of moving species, populations, or genotypes to a location outside of their known historical distribution for the purpose of maintaining biological diversity or ecosystem functioning as an adaptation strategy for climate change. One species that is undergoing assisted migration is Florida torea, torea taxifolia, which has sparked much debate. You can find information about this project by searching for Florida torea or the torea guardians. 
I encourage you to check it out because it is an interesting case study of both conservation policy and biology of my assisted migration. We at Native Plant Trust and NEPCOP are still deciding if this is something we should or should not do. There are a lot of questions surrounding this concept. If we do decide to manage the migration of certain species, how do we pick which target species and taxa would be most likely to benefit and decide which ones would not? When should this occur for a species or taxa? Or at what level of threat? How do we determine the level of threat before we move them? And should we conduct assisted migration experiments before there is even evidence of any threat? Are we open as New England to receive rare species from further south? And who makes the final decisions and calls on how this works, and if it should? There is still a lot of discussion about this and what the best practices and relative risks may be. Thank you very much for watching. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me at mjasney at nativeplanttrust.org.